So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. We have a pretty exciting meeting planned. My name is Bill Manning and I'm a director recently promoted to executive director of ASPI. A uh, quick footnote, I've been on active surveillance since 2009 and I'm still a member of my local support group that got me started on this journey. Our purpose here is to educate individuals about options regarding active surveillance, which is not a treatment, but a management plan. I would like to remind everyone that we are not anti-treatment, but anti-unnecessary treatment. So a couple of quick housekeeping measures. We're going to hold all questions until the last speaker. You can submit questions in the chat box, which we will try to address after the last speaker. At that time, you can also click the raise hand button from the bottom of the Zoom window toolbar. And if there's time, we'll try to call on you. Please keep yourself muted during the meeting. However, if you mistakenly unmute yourself, I will be happy to assist in muting you. The speakers presenting here today are generously donating their time, so we want to be respectful of that. We are not here to dispense with any medical advice. Nothing said during these meetings by our speakers, ASPE, or the audience should take the place of your consultations with your medical professionals. Also, you do not need to feverishly take notes during the talk as this meeting is being recorded and will be available on our website in approximately a week. You'll get an email notifying you when it's ready. Also, if you subscribe to us on our YouTube channel, you will automatically be notified when a new video is posted. Last item is watching the meeting. If you will notice in the upper right corner of your Zoom window, there's a button that says View. When you click that, you can switch between the gallery view, which is everyone, or focus on the speaker. We highly recommend selecting speaker, which helps you focus on the topic at hand versus what someone in the audience is having for lunch. So without further ado, we will have a few quick words from Mark Lichty, our chairman, who will then turn the meeting over to Howard Walensky, active surveillance professor emeritus and the organizer of this meeting. So relax, enjoy the meeting, and I hope you leave a little bit smarter. Take it away, Mark. Thank you, Bill, and welcome to you all. And Bill, I want to thank you personally. By the way, I have some notes here, but due to my stroke, that I had eight months ago, I can't read them, so I'm just going to talk to you. But Bill, I want to say to you, uh, I approached Bill about eight months ago asking if he'd be interested, after my stroke, asking if he would be interested in, in uh, being the executive director, and he has indeed consented. So he, we have probably one of the best executive directors that we could find, particularly with his years of active surveillance. So we're so happy about that and the 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 program today is i'm i'm so excited about the program today because it fits right in with what we're about we're we've we've been about trying to avoid over treatment of prostate cancer and then over biopsying well and now uh the the dan has stumbled on how to maybe not over oh, provide administer uh unnecess unnecessary adt uh, uh therapy which is huge and so this this ai may may be presenting a whole new arena for for us it's right in line with our mission so one other thing I, I wanted to mention to you too is last month if you were here for the genetic webinar i spoke about uh, my disappointment with uh, Secretary Austin and the fact that uh, he had not uh, been forthright in disclosing his prostate uh, operation. We believe it was prostate cancer. And uh, and we sent a letter and to asking that he apologize. And, and I pleaded in the webinar, too, that he apologized. Well, he did. It was an extremely elegant apology, and it's online if you're interested in his apology. Uh, it was a wonderful apology, and and two, his apology was important because he's a, a, an Afro-American, and Afro-Americans die twice as much as Caucasians. 
And so if he set a tone of speaking candidly of prostate cancer, other people uh, will see that he's a public figure and maybe he will open that up a little bit. That was our hope. And I, I too, wanted to mention that, uh, you know, ASPI does a lot of things behind the scene. I mean, we do these webinars, we do these these educational things, but we also do things behind this thing, you scene to, to, to move things forward in active surveillance because we're, we're extremely committed to that. But in the end, we care most about you we care because we've most of us that are on the board have reached a place of peaceful vigilance so we don't i don't worry about psa tests i don't worry about by i don't worry about any of that stuff um, because we found a place where we're comfortable and our quality of life is preserved and so that's what we hope we can do for you and we believe we can help you get to that same place as we kind of hack through the active surveillance jungle together. With those words, I'd like to introduce my dear friend, uh, Howard Walensky. And Howard, thank you so much for organizing this. This is going to be a fascinating webinar. Well, thanks, Mark. And welcome, everybody. And special thanks to our speakers. Uh, our topic today is artificial intelligence or, or machine learning. It's affecting our lives. It's affecting your life, and you may not even know it. It's in the news every day. It seems like half the time we're being warned about AI and Terminators taking over the world in dire effects, uh, damage to our personal freedoms or problems by a generation of inaccurate and even dangerous material. But the other half of the equation is AI, maybe sometimes too effusively, is described as a savior for humanity. In fact, it's probably somewhere in the middle, but one area where there's definitely advantages coming from AI now and in the future is, uh, is in the medical area and even specifically prostate cancer, which is our focus here. In fact, a study came out this week in which British researchers using AI were able to identify a, a new form of aggressive prostate cancer that could make a difference in how the cancer is diagnosed and treated. So that's the future. So we're gonna to talk today about the future, but also the present. We're gonna have a panel of experts. I'll introduce them in turn. Uh, but first, uh, we're going to start with Kirk Wino. Kirk is a board-certified anatomic and clinical pathologist who trained at Johns Hopkins. He's chief medical officer of Immunis AI in the Detroit area. The company is using AI to develop an approach to help newly diagnosed patients decide whether to go on active surveillance or to seek active treatment. So, Kirk, I'll turn it over to you. He's also going to give a broad view of AI. So, Kirk, it's your turn. Yeah. Thanks, Howard. Um, while I'm getting my slides up here, um, again, as he said, my name is Kirk Wino. I'm a uh, practicing pathologist for about uh, a little over 30 years now. I've uh, been in the uh, prostate uh, space uh, for that entire time doing uh, research. Um, and so, when Howard asked me, um, he originally asked me to talk about what immunist.ai is doing in the active surveillance space, which I do as a second half. And then a couple of days ago, I think one of the other speakers dropped out. So he asked me to give an overview of uh, active surveillance. Um, and, and so I, I, I took on that challenge. Um, and so for that part of the talk, I'm going to kind of talk about how pathologists are using AI today um, uh, in real time uh, uh, to make diagnosis and, and how that can help improve the quality of the diagnosis to help patients make better decisions uh, in active surveillance. Um, so where I thought I would start, uh, so I, I actually uh, thought I would start with, the, uh, with language. Language, I think, has been one of the, the key applications of artificial intelligence, and we're all familiar with it, uh, you know, using chat GPT, some of the open AI 
things that are out there and you can ask it questions. So on the left, I'm not going to read it all to you. I asked it, what is artificial intelligence? It, gets, it gave a very eloquent uh, uh, summary for me over there on the left. Um, and so it, it, it's definitely making challenges, but I wanted to put this in the context of healthcare and explain where we're at and, and what, what's going on in healthcare and where we go with that. But just as a basic definition, what is AI? AI is a artificial intelligence or machine learning, as Howard said, and it learns from data. The more data you feed it, the better it learns. And now at some point, when you think it's learned good enough, you can kind of lock it down and validate it. We're going to talk a, lot, a little bit about validation and how important that is to make sure you're getting uh, uh, good answers. I know in our pre-conference uh, banter, Howard was saying fact-checking. Fact-checking is like validation. So as a scientist, you know, we can let these model building algorithms build you know good models to recognize patterns as a pathologist looking at prostate cancer it's one of the most heterogeneous cancers out there there's many many different patterns and all have you know different subtle nuances in their biologic behaviors and so the ai uses those patterns to make predictions predictions about biology and what's going to happen and you know how aggressive your cancer may be or how indolent it may be and then that can help you uh, make clinical decisions um and so the, the good thing about AI is we can put, you know, lots of different inputs in there. You know, you put all the clinical information in the AI and you can put, you know, biologic information in the AI, and then you can ask it to find, you know, optimal parameters to make the best predictions. Um, and then you can, you know, use regular statistics to make sure that whatever you've added to the standard clinical parameters is statistically better than what you started with. And so those are kind of the, the stepwise uh, you know, process um, you know, that we go do to. But the key thing about the, it, 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 it's the, with these algorithms, they're kind of self-learning. They can adapt to new situations, you know, cause you can ask any question uh, you want here and it will, uh, you know, it'll go on. So I asked it here to give me a good graphical representation of AI. So it answered me and said, well, it's not a graphical program. It couldn't do that but it gave me um, a nice lift, list of steps of AI. And so just to kind of reiterate what I said, you know, the way we use it in the laboratory is we input data, the more data, the better. And so in the company that I'll talk about, Immunist.ai, AI, we're, we're loading, you know, terabytes of genomic information from thousands of patients in here um, to help us learn about how the immune system reacts to cancer. And I'll talk about that in the next thing, you know, so then we process it, we build a model, you know, we train the model, then we lock it down and then we try to validate it on independent data sets. Um, and so that's kind of the, and then, then you have a feedback loop. You can keep doing that. And again, I've been with the company for about 10 years and we've been doing these feedback loops, continue to learn, continue to refine our process that I'll talk about. But AI can continue to do that in real time. So I asked AI, what are some of the regulatory challenges that AI you know, is going to face? And so it answered it very generally on the left. Um, but, but, you know, algorithm transparency, you know, some of the AI mathematics and statistical things, uh, some of the neural networks, it becomes very hard to dissect them out and understand what's going on. And as a scientist, you know, I like to understand. And so it's all about taking what your AI has, you know, taught you and then trying to dissect it and understand it uh, from a you know, biologic perspective. It's back to, again, what Howard said, verify everything. Um, the other thing, as I said, you know, at, at, at right now, most people will build, you know, a very good model and kind of lock it down and validate it. And that's kind of how the, you know, the scientific community is working today and the you know, regulatory agencies and the payers who want everything locked down. But the, the notion of continuous calibration and continuous learning um, and then using that continuous learning to make decisions uh, is one that I think regulators are, are being challenged by. And I think we're all as a community have to work together, you know, to find the best way uh, to handle this, you know, because the models that we've built, and I'll talk about our first product that will be coming out here in the next couple of years. Um, but but it, it the more data we feed it, the better it learns. Um, so you can have version two, version three. But at some point, if we can develop a way to monitor it and validate it continuously in real time, we can have a continually improving um, you know, algorithm that can make the best uh, decisions. Um, again, when I asked about all the other uh, challenges, you know, there's bias, there's fairness, liability issues, ethical considerations, all of which we don't have time to talk about today. Uh, so in the, in the uh, laboratory, again, um, I've been a big fan of digital pathology. I've been taking images of prostate cancer biopsies uh, since I was at the University of Michigan uh, in the 1990s. Um, and then from there have, have continued, you know, a lot of research here. And so 
in the laboratory today, um, on the left side, I'm not going to go through all the, the details on the right, but on the left side, you'll see a biopsy board, um, which is the best way to fix prostate needle biopsies. You know, uh, some urologists still will put them in bottles of formalin and fix them, leads to overfixation and perhaps not the optimal molecular testing. Um, you know, but here on, the, on that biopsy board, the urologist will put the needle biopsy cores on the biopsy board. And so we use AI, uh, we've trained it to recognize the biopsy tissue on the biopsy board. And you can see those multiple colors, um, uh, you know, there, there, you know, the red, the orange, yellow, green, um, blue and black. It, it's recognized the board, it's recognized the location where each core is placed, and it actually measures the cores uh, for us. Um, again, but we we validate this continually. Every month we do measurement validations to make sure it's measuring accurately, make sure it's accurately, you know, finding the tissue, you know, that we have. Um, and so, you know, it, we lock it down for a period of time. And then we, um, you know, if there's improvements, we move it on. Next in the laboratory, we take it off of those biopsy boards and we put the needle cores in biopsy chips. These are auger-based things that allow the histotex to cut the tissue uh, more optimally. And so having this you know, matrix hold all the cores flat, um, you know, we've done some research in the past. We've shown that uh, you know, as a pathologist, I get to see more tissue. There's less tissue that goes into the waste bin uh, because uh, you know, a single core of tissue, um, if you tip it just a few degrees, a lot of it doesn't get sectioned in the plane of section and you lose that and it goes into the bin. And so as a pathologist, I want to see the most tissue possible, you know, in the best orientation, um, you know, to make the best diagnosis that will help you know, the urologist and the patient have a shared decision about, you know, safely going on active surveillance. And I'm all about active surveillance, but we need to do it safely and make sure we haven't missed something that's more aggressive that we, we do want to treat. Um, and the other thing that AI does, you can see the AI is, is again identified all the tissue. And if you look at that top right picture, you can see, I don't know if you guys can see my pointer here, but I, I use it anyway. You know, the, these auger-based chips have little dots, like little fiduciaries. The AI can recognize all this. We maintain the orientation of every needle core. See the little arrows here. And so when I, as a pathologist, do my work now on a computer screen instead of a microscope, it'll document where the tumor is along the needle core, how close it is to the capsule, how deep it is, um, and it gives us a lot of details. Uh, you know, so again, these AI measurements uh, are really helping us out as pathologists. And so from that, we then, uh, you know, make uh, glass slides off of those chips. You can see here on the bottom right uh, that we can, under the microscope, you can see the auger-based matrix. You can still see the arrows and the little dots, and you can see the prostate needle cores and the little red circles around the cancer there. Um, but again, all this is, you know, aut automated and digitized on an automated platform, um, you know, which is really helpful. And so, you know, today the pathologist, they're showing somebody here using an iPad uh, and drawing a circle around the tumor. I personally use a large, you know, 28 inch uh, touchscreen uh, Surface Studio. And I like to draw circles with my fingers around each cancer. And, and again, time after time using this technology, I'm a, a better pathologist. I can find more, you know, finding better characterize the cancer that's there, you know, to make the best uh, decision. Uh, so there's a picture of me at my large uh, screen uh, doing what I do uh, uh, significantly, uh, significant part of my time every day. Um, but for the AI part, again, I, I, I uh, collaborated with many companies and within software platforms, these companies have integrated themselves, you know, with their AI algorithms, which is which are very good at recognizing the cancer and highlighting the cancer and even grading the cancer. And so, in this example here, you know, the blue outlines on the right is is the can is the AI algorithm finding you know Gleason uh, pattern three. Uh, cancer, um, you know, which falls into three plus three equals six, the grade group one, you know, for me, the low grade cancer that we want to find. And then it, the the red, the, the maroon colored highlights there are, you know, the things that the computer think is Gleason, computer thinks is Gleason pattern four. And so, you know, with all of that, um, you know, right now, uh, I don't think any pathologist is using this diagnostically. We use this as kind of a quality control check to make sure that we've, uh, you know, found all the cancer, that we've graded it accurately. Um, you know, when I first partner with some of the companies, you know, their, their computer doesn't do so well, but the computer does learn continuously over time. And after several months, the computer is giving me back basically what I've taught it over time, you know, the, you know how to call things. Uh, and so where this really helps in a larger company is to standardize 
uh, diagnoses. And so I've worked with uh, groups of pathologists and companies, and we've shown that we've been able to, you know, really uh, as pathologists who, if you leave us to our own device, there's been a lot of publications about how our Gleason grades don't always agree with each other. And as, as patients, I always recommend, you know, have your slides sent and get a second pathology opinion, very important, or even a third one if they disagree, you know, to make sure you're getting the same diagnosis. But the AI is really helping to standardize, you know, this and give reproducible you know, grading throughout. And so that's really how we're using it today. Um, and I think we're going to hear a little bit later, uh, people are now taking this, this very reproducible Gleason grading or, or image analysis uh, of the tissue, and we can use it to make predictions about uh, all sorts of things, all sorts of biologic questions we might want to ask, like, you know, whether or not someone should be treated, whether or not you should be on uh, an androgen deprivation therapy, and those types of things. But it's, it's very exciting. But the caveat here, just to finish my general starting comments, is that, you know, right now we're kind of at the stage where we we let the AI learn, we tend to lock it down, and then we uh, uh, validate it on independent sets and more validations, the better. And then beyond that, we feel comfortable using it somewhat for, for clinical practice. But again, I think the medical community is being very cautious on how we move forward. And, and again, I'm excited to see how we address what I call the continuous calibration uh, over time. And so with that, after, you know, working on tissue for many years, you know, very interested in molecular uh, biology and molecular signatures, you know, I've, I've collaborated with a lot of the companies who I think one of your previous uh, sessions were on, you know, the molecular uh, things you can do on tissue biopsies to help make uh, decisions for active surveillance. Um, but with prostate cancer, again, it's very heterogeneous. When you stick a needle into the cancer, there's always sampling error. You don't know if you actually had the needle hit the worst part of the tumor. Um, some of the molecular tests that are out there on tissue help around that. But the company I'm with now, the immunist.ai, we wanted to understand how the immune system interacts uh, with cancer. Because as a pathologist, having done hundreds of autopsies throughout my career, you know, many men or many people, men, women die. Uh, you know, with cancer, with small cancers that were never detected, that are indolent, and their immune system was keeping it at bay. It's in, there's an equilibrium here. You know, the immune system is, is designed to, uh, you know, find cancers and help eliminate them. Uh, but the cancers get smart and they learn ways to evade our immune system. So there's this constant struggle and equilibrium of the immune system trying to keep, you know, control of the cancer. And then we have our stresses of daily life, as I like to put it, and our immune system gets weakened because we're stressed and we're not uh, taking care of our bodies the way they should. And, it, and it's when they, we get a disequilibrium and the cancer can escape the normal immune surveillance, that's when cancers become more aggressive and, and take off and, and tend to do uh, bad things to patients. And so the goal of our company was to use AI to try to understand, you know, can we detect these changes in the immune system as prostate cancer is going from the indolent phase to the aggressive phase? And so our, our platform does a lot more than that. Uh, we, you know, we think we can look at screening, you know, making treatment decisions, uh, you know, uh, and looking for minimal residual disease after treatment or radical prostatectomy. Um, but again, we're a small company. We focused all of our efforts on active surveillance uh, for now. But, you know, as we uh, expand, we hope to get into the rest of, uh, rest of these areas. And so um, I'd like to just give a little bit, and you guys are, are, are all on active surveillance, so you're very familiar with the patient journey. So one of our missions is how can we help as a company to help this patient journey? And, you know, you've all been in the scenario where you go see your urologist, you have an elevated PSA, they may order an MRI, you wait for those results, you come back, they decide to do a biopsy, whether it's a fusion biopsy or regular biopsy. Um, you then have, you know, they take the tissue out, they send it to the pathologist, the pathologist works it up. Um, he may, you know, then provide the answer to the urologist who then decides he wants some molecular testing done on the tissue that gets sent out and it comes back. So it can take, you know, quite a while and a number of visits to get all the data, you know, that's required. And so, um, and, and again, becoming a human pin cushion over time, multiple needle biopsies, it's not a, not a pleasant way to undergo surveillance. And so, hope of our company is to have a blood test looking at the immune response, how different aspects of the immune system uh, 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 understand what's going on with the cancer. And so our, our system, we, we look at, we take a blood sample, we separate out pure populations of various immune cells, one from the innate, one from the adaptive immune system. You know, these have names and numbers, which are probably not important for this audience. And then we basically extract the RNA. That's the RNA is what ends up being translated into proteins. Um, and, and that's what 
uh, drives the you know, biologic behavior of the cells. And so what we did with AI is took all of these, you know, 20,000 plus genes from two different purified cell types, looked at their expression levels from each gene at the two different cell types. Um, and we uh, uh, looked at that together and said, you know, can the artificial intelligence help us to understand this and in, in a way that we can make predictions on biologic behaviors of tumors. Um, and so what we found is by looking at two different cell types and that are uh, looking at cancer in two different ways, you know, can the signals coming from these be used? And, and the AI algorithms taught us that, you know, looking at the two different cell types and looking at the difference of expression between these two uh, ways that the immune system looks at cancer were very valuable. Um, and so, we were very excited about this. We wanted to go into the active surveillance space. Um, you know, we, we know that there's lots of issues in active surveillance um, for the patient experience I just talked about. You know, the compliance with follow-up biopsies is, is not, um, you know, always adapted. But, but are all these follow-up biopsies necessary? And can we find a better way around that? Um, and, and, but as, as one of the other speakers said, you know, it's really um, understanding uh, that and in, in, in moving forward. Uh, in essence of time, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the tissue molecular test. I think you've heard about that probably at previous concert, uh, previous um, uh, sessions here. And so what we did is we uh, we have two publications out. This first one here was in cells um, in 2021, 20, uh, and we just have another paper out in the Journal of Urology that's um, out electronically ahead of print, which I'll talk about in a minute uh, in the Journal of Urology issue this month. Um, but we first asked the AI, you know, can you identify aggressive cancer? If we take a blood sample and then follow it up with a biopsy, can we train, can the AI train to recognize these gene patterns in two different cell types uh, that can um, uh, predict aggressiveness of cancer? And so we did that, you know, the, uh, the machine learning, it learned very well. Um, you know, there's statistical numbers down there, um, uh, area under the curve, kind of complicated statistic, but it, it shows how well you know, the, the model does it predicting aggressive cancer. You know, it did very well. We trained it with the number of samples we had. We had a thousand patients, again, with 20,000 genes um, and, and the two different cell types, which, you know, from a mathematician standpoint, it, it's um, there's too many variables and not enough patients. And so this is where machine learning and AI really helped us out to try to fit models without overfitting them that would give reproducible results going forward. Um, and then we know going forward, the more samples we can give the AI solution, the better it will do. And so, you know, that was on a non-active uh, surveillance type population. Next, we wanted, we decided to say, take that base knowledge, you know, can the artificial intelligence be trained to ask a, a, another level of question, which is, you know, uh, is it you know safe or appropriate for men to stay on active surveillance? And so, you know, we used a, a surrogate active surveillance population for this study that's uh, coming out uh, in the March issue of in urology, um, where we were able to use 107 genes uh, in a sophisticated model with you know different weightings, um, and these genes were complementary to the clinical variables that we already have. And we we took a lot of time in both of these manuscripts to show that you know that the what the artificial intelligence and the genetics was uh, showing was additive uh, to the uh, clinical information that uh, we already uh, have and use today. And, and that's uh, letting the AI build a better model for the clinical information. There are clinical algorithms out there that people use, but often urologists use their intuition to make these models. And so again, this is another place where I think AI can really help. It's taking those standard clinical variables that we all have today, making our best predictions based on what it has learned, adding any other evidence that you have available, you know, molecular genetic evidence, immunologic evidence like we have here, and then looking at how AI can make the best predictions. And so, you know, in the end of the day, our, our platform you know, puts out a risk score that separates men into very low risk, you know, low risk men have the same uh, risk that they had when they entered active surveillance and then high risk men who should not be on active surveillance uh, based on this. Um, and so here, a lot on this slide, but just at the bottom, I put some, you know, clinical vignettes. I'll just go through very rapidly to put this kind of in context of what's happening today. Six-year-old gentleman with a Gleason grade group one cancer on biopsy with an increasing PSA over a two-year period from two to 5.7, who has not had a repeat a biopsy at that time. Uh, his DRE was negative. Um, you know, he had our uh, blood test looking at this immune response, and the AI uh, was predictive that he was, even though his PSA has gone up, he's still at very low risk uh, and could uh, stay on active surveillance. 
at the other end of the spectrum, and again, another 60-year-old, Gleason grade group one cancer, PSA stable at five over this time period, PSA density is somewhat elevated when he started active surveillance, and it hasn't changed, it's still where it is, you know, two years later now, but our risk put him at the very high end of high risk, you know, his cancer was evading his immune surveillance system and becoming aggressive, so just to summarize here in the end of my time, um, the, our, um, you know, our test, uh, our goal, uh, we're running some clinical uh, utility and clinical validity studies later this year. Uh, uh, and so our, our test is not commercially available yet. Um, at, at a little bit later this year, you could enroll in one of our clinical trials uh, where the test results as research use only would be available to your clinicians. Um, and, and the questions we're trying to answer is, should a patient enter active surveillance in the first place? And then if he's on active surveillance, should he remain on active surveillance um, and or should he has his cancer now progressed or changed or evaded his immune system that he should exit active surveillance. So I know I talked a lot. Hopefully I stayed within my 20 minutes um, and thank you very much for your attention and I will stop sharing. So the next speaker. OK, well, thank Thanks, Kirk. And I, I found it really interesting that 25 percent of tissue is ends up in the garbage bin. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about that later. Yeah. But uh, the second speaker is uh, Bruno Berry. Bruno's uh, an old friend of mine. He's a fellow uh, patient. And he's seen the reality of AI and how it can uh, affect us as patients. Bruno started off on active surveillance. And he, unfortunately moved on to uh, be, be treated, but uh, there's some good news in there. So Bruno, maybe you can give a little bit about your, your case study. Don't expect any slides, anybody. You can only look at Bruno. So Bruno, why don't you go ahead? Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Or oh, good afternoon, I should say. My name is uh, Bruno Bray and uh, I'm 59 years old. And I was uh, basically diagnosed with prostate cancer uh, in 22, uh, September 22, and I was uh, a Gleason 6, 3 plus 3, 3 cores only. Uh, so I decided back then to stay on active surveillance. Uh, after six months, uh, I went for a fusion biopsy. And uh, fusion biopsy basically detected 16 core with uh, all affected basically 12 at 3 plus 3. And uh, the other three at three plus four. So active surveillance was pretty much no longer an option for me. And I had to uh, decide it for a, a treatment option. And uh, this is where I went to uh, uh, multiple places and I was looking for multiple opinions. I was looking for surgery, brachytherapy, um, uh, immunotherapy, radiation, all, all kind of uh, options available at the time. And uh, so I basically decided to go with a uh, SBRT and uh, with the use of AI, basically. I was looking for a, a treatment that possibly uh, give me a, be a better quality of, light, uh, of life. Uh, I don't want to have any side effect or at least minimize all the side effects. And so I uh, decided to go uh, in Cleveland at the UH hospital where uh, uh, I went through the, the SBRT treatment with AI. Uh, and AI, my AI test actually basically put me in a low risk, and I was avoiding ADT uh, with that test. I went through uh, the treatment. It's been six months. Uh, I've got nothing <laughs> bad to say. Treatment went well. I'm very well. I basically have rare, very, very basic side effect, but uh, I'm very happy with with the, the treatment so far, and uh, I'm glad that the AI uh, basically. Uh, help me to avoid ADT. Uh, so that that that's my story. Uh, I've been six months now uh, after my uh, treatment and so far so good, I'm doing okay, I'm doing well. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Spratt. <laughs> well, Bruno, thanks for sharing your story and maybe we'll have some more questions for you later from the patient point of view. Okay. As, it, as, it, as it happened, uh, Bruno's doctor in the end was Dr. Spratt. And so I'll give you a little rundown on, on Dan. He's chair of radiation oncology at University Hospitals in Cleveland. And he ordered uh, our Tira AI system. He says that two thirds of men 
um, making the transition to radiation from active surveillance or just straight on can now avoid a DT and, and its side effects. So Dan, why don't you tell your story? Great. Well, thank you guys. It's a true pleasure to talk to all of you and it's great uh, to see many of you and Bruno, I'm glad things have gone so well for you and the goal is for them to stay that way. So I'll, I'll give you guys an overview just from my perspective on uh, AI and prostate cancer in current state. I, I don't consult or get paid by the companies. The, I run a, these are mostly all clinical trials I help run around the, the world. So I said this actually earlier, but I think the goal is of a physician is to improve the way a patient experiences life. Now, there's many ways, and that's why you know we talk about shared decision making, because what is important to one man may be different to another man. Um, but if I cannot improve the way the patient in front of me defines, you know, uh, improving their experience of life, you should not get anything from me other than the conversation. You should not have me treat you. And so just to give you, this is uh, just an example of someone, um, but, you know, median age of prostate cancer is about 68. So 68 year old guy, PSA of six. He had Gleason score of three plus four, a gray group two. And, you know, more than half of the biopsies taken did have cancer in them. Um, MRI showed it was confined to the prostate, and uh, he was able to get a PSMA PET scan. That's a type of PET scan that scans the whole body, and it, it, no evidence it had spread anywhere. And so this, by our national guidelines, um, we created this definition back in 2013, back when I was at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, it's called NCCN, intermediate risk, but unfavorable intermediate risk. And so the guidelines to ultra simplify it, that we've taken this massively heterogeneous disease and we've said, okay, we're going to put a one size fits all approach. You can do radiation with a short course of hormone therapy, or you can have surgery. But for this patient here, it's about a 40 to 50% risk of recurrence and needing salvage or post-operative radiation therapy. So when we talk though about prostate cancer, you know, we have three standard of care main options we're always talking about. Um, and we know from randomized trials, so level one evidence that the oncologic outcomes, how long you'll live, the cancer spreading, the cancer dying for low risk patients and low grade patients is the same. But we know that any treatment, even as precise as radiation has gotten, it still has the potential for side effects. And so that's why we strongly prefer active surveillance. I don't treat low risk cancer. For intermediate risk, once you're Gleason 7, um, you know, we now have randomized trials showing that the cure rate is the same, whether you choose a surgical approach or a radiation approach. There's far less incontinence um, and erectile dysfunction with um, modern radiation, but there are some potential advantages for certain men of having surgery, but we still don't have good tools to tell us what to do. And then what about this whole thing of hormone therapy? I don't want to just say hormone therapy is bad because it has been shown to help many men live longer and prevent or reduce their cancer from spreading. So it has a role, but it also has a lot of different side effects that affect each man differently. Some of them are metabolic on the right, like body fat uh, tends to increase. You can have some increase in blood sugar, blood pressure. You can lose some muscle mass on the left, you know, whether it's fatigue or loss of libido or sex drive, hot flashes. And, you know, some guys, this actually minimally bothers them. Some guys, this bothers them tremendously and is a major impact in their quality of life. So the way we personalize it today, most commonly around the world, is this Gleason system. This is Dr. Gleason from the 1960s who made this system and drew um, you know, these patterns he would see under the microscope. I mean, zero, this, none of this is intended to criticize Dr. Gleason. This is absolutely remarkable. But we also must just recognize that this is like, think of what a car was or a computer was or in 1960 versus what we have today. 
this is very archaic when we're talking about a very personalized system to tell men how to get treated. And this Gleason system has evolved over the years. But again, this evolution was not trained to tell you what treatment to have. It was trained more so of more accurately binning patients. And so it's not surprising that I'm going to show you this system is not very accurate. So we have looked at it repeatedly, but this is in a very large study we did, and over 10,000 men treated on very high quality randomized trials followed many of them out to 20 years after their uh, diagnosis. And there's a statistic you'll often see that when we're talking about things, it's called um, an AUC. And basically, if I, if I had 100 guys in front of me and I flipped a coin, so let's say the, the test I had was a coin, I'd be right half the time, an AUC of 0.5. Well, Gleason score is only right a little bit more than half the time if these men were going to develop a biochemical recurrence or their PSA rise or if they were going to die. Um, and so that's not very encouraging to us. And so there's been a lot of work done to try to improve our ability um, to tell men how aggressive their cancer is or how to get treated. And so what we started with was Gleason grading. It's a phenotype, right? It's just a pattern of cells. Then as MRI now is very much standard of care. There's ways you can grade things uh, with MRI. These again are done most commonly by humans. And there's a lot, as you, you heard earlier, a fair amount of inter-reader variability. You give the pathology slides or the MRI to one pathologist or radiologist, depending um, on the center, you can have 25, 35% disagreement. So this is not what I would say is quantitative. There's, of course, lots of work has been done with genomics where you take tissue and you extract genetic material and you try to quantify it and to be an objective measure. And there's obviously there's cost implications. There's um, other things that have limited this widespread adoption. But now, rather than solely focusing on what I would say are human interpretable features, right, what can the you know, what Dr. Gleason has created or the radiologist can see, and it looks like my camera's like glitching out, which I apologize, um, is um, can we use machine learning to extract features from this pathology slide, for example, that are human interpretable and potentially non-human interpretable, that there's a lot of information on here that is not used in the Gleason system. And can this ultimately be just as good or maybe even better um, than using, you know, genomics or something very quantitative. So AI is nothing new. We just didn't really talk about AI until it got to this sort of deep learning and really the generative AI that we're seeing with like chat GPT. But, you know, many of you will remember when the, you know, world chess champion got his butt kicked by, you know, an AI model um, called Deep Blue, which, no one thought a computer would ever beat a human. And now, you know, on your phone, you can have an, you know, any chess app will have AI bots that can beat the best chess player, you know, without any effort. So just to touch on some of these, um, and, and there are places, and this is especially increasing um, in various parts of the world. This is just one company, there's multiple. But this is an example where, you know, there are millions of prostate biopsies done every year in the United States. And if you think about all these biopsy cores, um, and some of these biopsies, right, are 12 cores, some of them up over 20 cores, a pathologist has to look at every single one of those, you know, day in, day out. And there is a non-trivial chance that potentially some area could be missed. What this, uh, the intention of this company is just to say, is there cancer, yes or no? And so you would think of that as a very efficient, if you had hundreds of biopsy cores in front of you, if you're looking at, if you could have a very high confidence uh, that there's no cancer in it, this is going to be an efficiency gain and to focus on the cores that obviously have cancer. But what you'll see here in this validation model 
near perfect. If this was 1.00, that would be basically perfect that they missed and missed nothing. This is about as good of an AUC as you'll see 0.997. So this is, um, you know, something that I think in many parts of the world, many institutions, that this is probably just as good as a human at detecting if there is cancer. Obviously, there's heterogeneity in that, you know, compared to a very, very expert human, maybe that last case uh, the human would catch. What the AI has not been as good as, and I just showed you Gleason grading is not very good at identifying ultimately the true aggressiveness of cancer, is if you look here on the left, this is a pathologist score. So this is the grade group one to five or Gleason six to 10. And this is their AI model. And this is the same group that did the last work I just showed you. And in a perfect, if they agreed 100% of the time, right, the AI would call it Gleason 9, 10, and the human would. And so it'd be along this line, but you can see they don't all agree. And the agreement, this is a statistic, is about 0.65. It's not great. The paper concluded it's actually just fine because when they compared their pathologist to other pathologists, it, the humans agreeing with other humans was about the same. And so I often say, maybe Gleason grading is not very easily reproduced because it's not highly prognostic. It's not that accurate. And maybe it's really not identifying the true biological phenotypes because neither humans can 100% agree with humans and AI can't even agree with humans. So maybe we need to just move completely past Gleason and say, well, do we care about the grade or do we care about, are you gonna recur or develop metastasis or die? How actually biologically aggressive is this cancer? So can you use this digital pathology, use the features on it, and see if, can you predict, will men, like I said, metastasize or have really biologically aggressive disease? And so this is um, the validation work uh, that we collaborated with both, it's called NRG Oncology, a big clinical trials group, um, with um, Artera AI. They're a company. I don't work for them, but I'm an academic collaborator with them. And what you see here is, this is that, again, metric of AUC, 0.5 would be a coin flip. Our standard NCCN guideline tools here in this data set, and this was in clinical trials, was around 0.7. And it's looking at distant metastasis developed five years after treatment or 10 years after treatment. And using this AI model, it's significantly better. This is quite a bit better. It's not perfect. There is no model right now that's perfect, but this is uh, uh, some of the best accuracy you'll see in the published literature for endpoints like distant metastasis. And in even individual trials, you'll see here, this is an intermediate risk trial, so like more Gleason 7. You can see that using this AI tool is far more accurate. And in a trial of more high-risk men, still far more accurate. And sometimes what's very, you know, jumps out at you is this, what I'm going to show you is a group of people, of patients that are all high risk. Okay. So these are all high risk patients. And I think, Robert, you're drawn on Zoom, you're annotating my slides, which is totally fine. I'm just letting you know, is um, if you were to look at these high risk men, okay, that have Gleason scores, you know, typically eight to 10, if your Artera, a lower score, this AI model low score, you only had an 8% risk of developing metastatic disease. Again, these are all high risk men. If you have this AI model high score, you have about a 31% of developing distant meds. So the national guidelines would tell you these men are the same. Clearly these are not the same and same here is um, we've got the low score patients, only 8% would die of prostate cancer. The high score, you know, a third of men would die of prostate cancer. So you can see here that now this is in NCCN guidelines as a, as a test that's trained for various endpoints with level one validation because it's been validated now in nine completed randomized trials. And probably the thing that's gotten the most buzz and excitement is the predictive 
part of this biomarker. And so what that means is uh, the holy grail would be that if you had what we call it biomarker positive disease, let's say there was something special about your tumor that if we were to give you hormone therapy, you would have almost no chance of recurrence, but without it, you would recur. Like you really need that hormone therapy or you need that drug. However, if you're biomarker negative or if you don't have that feature in your tumor, adding the drug, adding the hormone therapy is not going to help you. So that's what we did is we used multiple randomized trials to basically see, can we identify features that will tell us which men benefit or do not benefit from hormone therapy? And so this was published in it's called the New England Journal of Medicine, their newer evidence um, journal just came out in June of last year. And this is the first time in history we have ever validated anything, genomics, imaging, any biomarker to predict men who do or do not need hormone therapy. And so to walk you through this, what you see on the left of the screen is all the men on this trial, okay? These are mostly intermediate risk men, men with Gleason 7 disease predominantly. And on average, if you look here in the red curve, that's guys that got radiation. And in the blue curve is the guys that they added a short course of hormone therapy. They had a lower risk, about 6% develop metastasis if you got the hormones versus about 10%. It's a small difference, but this is why the guidelines say we should add hormone therapy to these men. But now if you apply this biomarker from Artera, about one third of men, only a third of men will have biomarker positive disease or ones that will benefit from hormone therapy. These men have a 10% absolute benefit in distant meds. If you get the hormone therapy, very few will ever develop metastatic disease. Without hormone therapy, over 10% will. But if you're model negative, which is two thirds of men, there is absolutely no benefit of getting hormone therapy. The curves are on top of each other. So when I see patients, we have all these standard features of the case I showed before, but you add in biomarkers like this, who has a low risk so that prognosis is favorable, which is, gives me far more confidence than the Gleason score. And it's predictive biomarker negative, meaning it was less likely to benefit from hormone therapy. And so I typically will have a nice long shared decision-making conversation with the patient and radiation alone is often what the patient ends up deciding. And I think it's a good treatment option. And so in this specific patient's example, someone asked what SBRT is. It's five treatments of very precise radiation with a spacer hydrogel and in multiple randomized trials. So rigorous evidence, thousands of patients with intermediate risk, only about 5% or less of men will recur. There's functionally no incontinence. There was not even 1% with grade one, sorry, with grade two rectal side effects. So no needing modium or rectal bleeding or things like that. Only about 12% develop erectile dysfunction. It's only seven outpatient short visits. It's in guidelines, it's covered by insurance. And I say this, and Howard knows this, and I won't focus on it, but a lot of men trying to avoid side effects from surgery are now turning to things called focal therapy. And that's for a whole other webinar. But you can see from the data that's out there, this now to me and in most of the world is if you're looking for quality and quantity of life is a great treatment option. That's what was done for this patient. So thank you guys so much. Happy when we're all said and done with things to answer any questions you have. Well. Thanks, Dan. And, um, you know, I, th I think it's really a dramatic finding and uh, one that our next speaker can continue on that that two thirds of men who might have had uh, this this ADT can avoid it. So next speaker is Tim Showalter. <clears throat> He's a physician and chief medical officer at Artera AI, which Dan was just talking about. Tim is a radiation oncologist, cancer researcher, and a clinical professor at the University of Virginia. And uh, his test, his company's test has been making news. And I hope uh, Tim will give us a little bit of an update on where it stands in terms of reimbursement. So Tim, it's the, 
the ball is yours now. Well, thank you so much. And it's, it's great to see so many people uh, attending this and it's really a great forum. Um, I, as you mentioned, I'm a radiation oncologist. I focus primarily on prostate cancer. I still get to practice at the University of Virginia. Uh, and then I get to uh, participate in collaborative research with people like uh, Dan Spratt, who are brilliant and like really moving the, the field forward. So it's really um, a, a great uh, space to be in. Uh, I'm going to just keep my remarks very short. I actually hid some slides as Dan was going through because he presented the science so well. And I, I didn't want to be compared to you know his, his brilliant mind. So I'll just cover a little bit of our future plans. Uh, and uh, so first of all, just for a little bit of context about what our company's mission is. So our Terra AI is, is really focused on uh, taking uh, digital pathology images. So we typically are working with um, research specimens when we're developing tools uh, that are H&E stained biopsy slides. So these are the sort of materials that are, are just uh, developed as part of uh, diagnosis and they're included in, in, uh, in clinical trial uh, conducts. Uh, and so we apply artificial intelligence analysis to develop uh, tools that are both prognostic, meaning they give each an, a patient an individualized insight about how aggressive their cancer is and predictive. And, and I, I think uh, Dr. Spratt did a good job of, of uh, summarizing some, some excellent work that, that he was instrumental in uh, in terms of a collaboration. So how that works is that when we approach a a new uh, research indication, and we've gotten our start primarily in prostate cancer, and that's where we're really focused on making a big impact uh, right now. Uh, but we have a pipeline spanning other uh, solid tumors as well. Uh, so uh, we're going to make a, a global impact across oncology. Um, we generally start off with clinical trials data. Uh, those data sets are really important. Uh, you know, lots of prostate cancer patients have volunteered to participate in these trials provides a really great resource uh, to develop the best tools that we can to improve care. Um, and we use a combination of uh, some clinical data variables like PSA and patient age that are important to how a patient might um, do with, with uh, their treatment course, as well as uh, image data from the, the biopsy slides. So we will scan those and we work with an image file that provides a high resolution image. Uh, that provides the resources for a machine learning approach. So the, uh, there's a computer vision component for our test development where the AI is actually studying these scans, identifying what are the relevant tissue patches and basically creating a model of, of what uh, the biology of, or the morphology of prostate cancer looks like. So all, all the sorts of things that uh, expert pathologists are looking at um, in their career, plus maybe some additional features that humans typically don't uh, clue in on. Uh, and then we make a model to uh, predict both clinical events and benefit from therapy. Um, at the end of that uh, development process, we lock our models and then we move forth and validate the performance of these models on uh, clinical trial and data set after data set, just to make sure that, that we're confident that those models perform well. Um, we ultimately deliver those uh, results in the form of a test report. So, you know, our, our mission is to uh, improve the, the care of uh, men with prostate cancer. So when a test is ordered, uh, we deliver results that uh, provide information about that patient's prognosis. Uh, and for men with NCCN intermediate risk, you know, the science that, uh, that Dan presented uh, for identifying men who benefit from short-term hormone therapy, and maybe, you know, much more importantly, I think, the, the majority of men who don't uh, really derive, we estimate will not derive a benefit from, from adding hormone therapy to treatment. Um, we provide that information on this test report so that when the conversation happens with uh, the radiation oncologist or urologist and they're making their ultimate treatment decision, it's possible to have you know, a much more rich set of, of information that can directly inform uh, the treatment decision. Um, and as Dan mentioned, our, our test is on uh, NCCN clinical guidelines uh, alongside uh, some other gene expression tests and, and clinical risk grouping. Um, because we were able to collaborate with Energy Oncology uh, and work with a strong set of academic investigators, we were able to uh, demonstrate that our test uh, performs well uh, in a large set of data from randomized controlled trials. And for that reason, um, I believe we, we were given a high level of, of, uh, of clinical validation, essentially stating that 
the evidence that we submitted and, and how we've evaluated our models uh, passes a high scientific bar in terms of safe and effective use uh, for, for guiding patient decisions. The way that we're making this available currently is that it's available as a send out laboratory test. So essentially a, a physician would order this test uh, if, if the physician and, their pa and the patient are, are interested in getting these insights to guide their care. So typical scenario might be a patient who's trying to make a decision about whether they want to have uh, hormone therapy added to radiation, for example. So um, some clinical information is provided to our laboratory. We also receive a uh, H&E stain biopsy slide. So actually a glass slide gets shipped to our laboratory uh, in Florida. It's a CLIA uh, licensed laboratory. Uh, and we scan that slide and we're able to turn around results very quickly, typically within 24 hours of receiving the slides. So it's really faster than, than folks have typically seen with uh, tissue-based genomic tests. Um, so we're, we're proud of that, that uh, rapid turnaround time. Uh, that's our current model now. Uh, we do think in the future that the full realization of what AI can do is really putting it in the hands of pathologists. And, and in the future, we'd like to see this available at multiple hospitals throughout the, the country and the test can be uh, easier to get uh, broadly throughout the United States and, and even globally as well. Uh, one of the ways that this uh, can, can influence uh, clinical decisions is helping guide risk-based decisions. As, as Dan showed, uh, it's an effective risk stratification tool, and it may often lead to a uh, slightly different um, assessment of a patient's risk uh, compared to uh, traditional uh, clinical factors. What I've shown here are uh, the distributions. So if you look uh, on the y-axis, you've or, or sort of the left side of the slide, you've got uh, the MMEI risk score. So that's the that's the risk score or the risk group assigned um, to um, specimens in this uh, cohort uh, based upon the AI test. And so you know that's the sort of information that the Artera AI test is providing. Uh, and then on the bottom, you see uh, so along the columns, you see the NCCN risk groupings. Those are the clinical uh, variables. Uh, so PSA, tumor stage, Gleason score. And what you see is that uh, they don't always uh, perfectly align. And I think that's where the, the uh, information provided by the test can be helpful uh, for, for understanding what sort of treatments would be appropriate uh, and, and best suited to uh, limiting the quality of life uh, impact of, of the cancer treatments, but also making sure that we're providing uh, an optimal therapy. So I think what's really exciting and what our team is working on right now is uh, developing additional um, uh, algorithms that will, will provide useful uh, information for men contemplating active surveillance. Um, so we're not there yet. I'll tell you, we are a team with our, I'm sure right now, our, our machine learning scientists from Artera um, working on the active surveillance model right now. So we currently have over uh, data from over 2,000 uh, research participants who have provided uh, samples, including biopsy slides and clinical information, where we know what happened if, if, while, while that patient was on active surveillance. And so based on the materials from those men, we will be, uh, we're in the process of developing uh, artificial intelligence algorithms that will, I, will predict uh, outcomes uh, in the, while on active surveillance and, and help us uh, identify men who are likely to, to stay on active surveillance for a long period of time and get many years out of it versus those men who might progress on active surveillance. And that can be helpful for making decisions about what that, you know, how often MRIs and biopsies might be performed uh, during that procedure. Um, we're currently um, working on that right now. We expect at some point uh, later in 2024 to actually have a validated uh, model. So it, it, we do move pretty quickly. So we do we do anticipate making this available this year. Uh, and um, we've got a large set of, of data. It takes a lot of data to develop this. Um, we plan to provide information about um, identifying uh, those men who are going to have uh, an upgrading of their Gleason score over time uh, and uh, to predict what the likelihood of, of uh, adverse or, or uh, you know, high-risk pathological features uh, at time of surgery might be for those men who go on to prostatectomy. Uh, we also want to uh, do a good job of, uh, of having a biomarker to identify the large set of patients who really are, you know, can go on for years while on active surveillance, because we think that's a really valuable tool for 
for many men uh, faced with prostate cancer. So I will stop there just to, to and I realize a lot of this is forward looking. Um, we have our current test, which provides individualized information for, for prostate cancer. Uh, and I think specifically to this group, I probably honestly have more exciting updates to offer in a few a few months from now. Uh, so of course, you know, keep you posted on that. Um, but but we recognize this is this is really the biggest area where we can help the most men uh, in this space because, like you all know, uh, many men uh, really don't need to have uh, active treatment for their for their prostate cancer and they can instead uh, undergo active surveillance. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> Tim, thank you, and thanks to all the speakers. Uh, I appreciated, Tim, uh, the message about the benefits of active surveillance. And um, now I know there's been a little bit of activity going on in the chat box. I've been too focused on the speakers to follow that. But uh, I am going to take advantage of the fact that I organized this to ask a couple of questions, and then maybe we can open it up. Um, but, you know, one of the themes that I picked up on, two things. We're talking about a different kind of replacement theory. Uh, will Gleason scores be replaced? And so, uh, Bruno, you don't have to feel obligated to answer if you, unless you want to, but I'd like to hear from, uh, you know, the doctors. Do you really think the Gleason score will be replaced, and how long will that take? And And I also wonder... Will pathologists be replaced? Will this just be automated like so many other so many other tests are in medicine? So, you know, any one of the speakers can pick up on that. Kirk, I think you're talking, but we need your your mic. Sorry for unmute. mute. Yeah. No. As a pathologist, yeah, I've I've thought for a long time I will eventually be replaced. Hopefully I'll be retired before I'll I'll be replaced. But um uh, you know, I think these these image analysis tools that I've been studying for a long time, they're highly trainable. It, it's really the, the holdup now is, is really the regulatory and, and the continuous calibration and validation. Like everybody said here today, I mean, right now we lock things down, we validate and we feel comfortable using them. But as these systems can continuously evolve and get better, like I said, I've been involved with companies and in, in helping train their algorithms over time. And, you know, it doesn't take the computer very long until it's calling it exactly as well as I'm calling it. Um, and again, pathologists are a little leery right now. We're using it kind of as quality control and oversight, but I do think eventually it'll be replaced. As for the Gleason grading system, again, Gleason did a great job with the start. I mean, the, the International Society of Urologic Pathologists have refined it over years and, and, and have made improvements in it. But it's still that there are it's so heterogeneous that I think the computer eventually can do a better job than we can. And it'll put it into better buckets um, and, and better predictions and, and again, have large data sets. So, uh, again, I can't predict how long that'll take, but I, I do envision, you know, the computer reclassification will occur. You know, Kirk, it's, it's sort of a transition to the future. Mm -hmm. um, what role can AI play in between? In other words, will it be potentially a screener, you know, sort of a first opinion, and then it moves on to the pathologist or? Uh, yeah, yeah, you know. I've seen, I mean, today people are using it many ways, either using it as a screener, and then it goes to the pathologist, and I've seen them use it at the back end as a quality control, the pathologist sign out all their cases, and then, they, then you know, they're like held in a bin, and before they're released out to the doctor, the AI takes a look at it, make sure that, that the pathologist didn't miss anything, and then it's a great, you know, quality control tool you know, to do it like that. And then again, as I said in my talk, for as, at least as far as standardizing grading, I mean, it, it, pathologists, I've seen studies even worse than what were quoted. I mean, I think pa expert pathologists, the, the one study I was involved in with a bunch of experts several years ago, I mean, it was like we agreed 43% of the time. I mean, and you're talking about people who, you know, the person who trained me and other people, all these experts, well, we still disagree. But whereas the computer can, the computer always, what I think Dan didn't show or someone didn't show is that the computer agrees with itself all the time. That there's where you get the perfect agreement. So, um, <laughs> you know, com computers can't agree with humans because we keep changing our mind from, I call it Monday, Tuesday. It's different on a given day. But the power of the computer and the AI is it'll call it the same day after day after day. So. I just have one follow up uh, to to what you what you were saying uh, in, in terms of the miss rates. And I think Dan kind of got at this too. And you just did now. Uh, and I, you know, not just for 
pathology, but also with MRIs. Is there an agreement on what the miss rate is? And maybe I'm not using the right terminology. Is it false negatives, false positives? You know, so. And there yeah, are, definitely, you know, in, in our QC data, I mean, there, there's, there is definitely disagreement amongst pathologists. And so in the end of the day, what is the gold standard? I mean, you could take some expert pathologists as the gold standard, but they're not perfect either. So that you, what we usually report out is this disagreement rate. But but when you get down to cancer, no cancer, or whether you call it, usually it's the difference between a typical glands or, you know, a handful of glands that somebody's willing to call a great group one. And so it, it's that that tiny, and so you're kind of splitting hairs there. I mean, as a clinician, are, you know, you've got a great group one, you're going to go on active surveillance. You've got these atypical glands suspicious for cancer. You're probably going to do something similar to active surveillance or continue to look for something there. You know, there, you're, you're splitting hairs about what's agree and disagree from a cancer, no cancer perspective. But I do see the AI from what I've seen can help pick up those small things that were otherwise missed. But then in the context of active surveillance, the treatment's not going to likely be. Well, when, yeah, I was looking for like a percentage, you know, what, what is the, what is the miss rate? Dan, do you? And Howard, who's doing it and where, right? Because I, I think 80% right of patients are treated and diagnosed in various community practices and if you were to go to a big university hospital setting, it's going to be very different. And so to me, one of the big, I mean, the fact, I would say Kirk here is being, if you were to talk to a bunch of um, university pathologists, you'll, you'll see a dichotomy, but some will say there's not a chance no one can replace me when the studies we show um are just kicking the crap and it's not just pathology it's in radiology and my field in radiation oncology but i view these tools as you know kirk as a pathologist is helping train and involved in this next generation so that whole saying that ai won't replace whatever pathologist it's pathologists who refuse to use ai will be the ones replaced and so i uh, use the analogy of a typewriter versus microsoft word Microsoft Word gives us little squiggly lines under all our misspellings and auto checks, things as we go. It'd be archaic to use a typewriter. We're getting to the point now with ChatGPT that it can probably write the paragraph for you, but you may want to fine tune it. So it, it's an assistant. And I think that where it's not fully replacing, and it may eventually, but I think that there is still so much about human biology we don't understand that, you know, because Bruno opened up about his case, like if Bruno was someone who was far more worried about, like, I want to do everything I possibly can. I don't want even a 0.1% risk of it coming back. I want you to give me every bit of therapy. That's very hard, I think, for AI to have that shared decision making. But what it can do is say your risk is xyz and then have that personalized conversation um so i think i just gave a big uh keynote speech in spain and the people there i'll say that if exactly as kirk said when the regulatory and the liability to me it's actually the liability component who is responsible if ai messes up humans mess up all the time right all the time but if AI messes up even a fraction of a percent, who's liable? No company can is going to take you know that risk of a multi million dollar lawsuit. The doctor didn't is the do the doctors sign off on it? They don't want to be liable. So that's where the comfort level we've got to figure out. Um, but if that wasn't there, I think this would scale up at just frightening pace. Well, I, okay, now I know that we plan to quit at 1.30 Eastern, but uh, we need to open up the floor. And I don't know if Jeff or Mark or, or Bill are monitoring the chat. Are there questions that you want to bring up from there? Or, or should we open up the floor? We, we do have some questions, but um, I'd like to make a brief pitch on behalf of the organization, Active Surveillance Patients International. Uh, we are very dedicated people, and we love you all for attending. But in order for us to continue, we would love you to make some donations. Now, 
I'm holding in front of me a wonderful Aspie mug. If you were, hey, I didn't see this commercial coming, guys. But keep well, going. you know what? Uh, we live on money, Howard. I'll be very brief. But anyway, uh, please make a donation if you feel like it. There is a donation uh, button on our website. Hey, it's look at good. Kim Bottles. He's not showing no. a bottle. He's showing a cup. A cup. And we do it. And you can put any liquids. Uh, we do not regulate the liquids you use. Thank you. Although, uh, I, if everything I see does not encourage alcohol. so I didn't say alcohol. It could be kombucha. In which case, be careful. Uh, but what about some questions from uh, the chat yeah. room? Yeah. I... Uh, I have a question here. Uh, it may have been answered, but I'm going to ask it. Uh, Ashtush asks for an online tool to self-diagnose. Uh, I think Dr. Spratt may have covered that, but this is the one question I'd like to provide. Not everybody was, in, I wasn't able to follow the, the chat room. So Dan. Ashtush, did you get yeah. your question or Dr. Spratt? I mean, the question read that, you know, let's say you guys, as you're tracking yourself on active surveillance, or let's say you've had surgery and you have your Gleason scores, your PSAs, like, can you plug that all in in some, like an AI algorithm, tell you what to do? I, I to my knowledge, um, most of the online platforms you could even potentially do that are, are supposed to prevent from giving medical advice. Um, I, I think for that whole liability thing we just talked about, I, I don't think that I'm aware of, and I'm curious if Kirk or Tim know, I, I don't know of anything that would give you medical advice what to do. Um, so I, I, there's things definitely like, could we create AI to say, hey, your PSA is this, you should now go get a biopsy or you should get treated? Yes. But I think still there's this element of shared decision making with patients that each of you have different preferences. You could probably get to the point where it could get that information as well. There's, you know, I fully believe, but I don't know what company would be willing to give you advice and then get risk being sued. Right, right. I, I'm only aware of there's risk calculators out there and it'll give you yeah. some risks and some probabilities, but it doesn't make that decision for you because every patient has their own threshold and it'd be hard for the computer to know what your risk threshold might be to help you make that decision. So I I, I agree with Dan. I've not seen anything um, out there that'll make a that'll make a decision, but it, it will you can there's plenty of tools out there to help you give you some probabilities and then you have to put that in with your own risk tolerance. Um, I would agree. There's so much like uh, the personal aspect of this. You got to really have to have, know the priorities of, e of each person that you're talking to. So there is that art of science that I think is going to be harder for, for AI to uh, replace. Howard, have we included all the speakers in this question? Or Anybody who wants to answer? Bruno, you have something? You know, Bruno, I have a question for you. When you were facing the prospect of ADT. Yeah. Uh, Dan Dan showed kind of a comprehensive slide of what the possibilities were for side effects. I mean, how how worried were you about that, and how relieved were you when when you got the result from AI saying that uh, you were not at risk, and and do you trust it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely uh, trust it. Um, when I got the news from. Uh, Doctor spread that uh, yeah AI can vary low, and uh, so ADT is not required for a treatment. So yes, I was uh, that was uh, a good good relief for me because I like I said I went to a different uh, uh, hospitals and the treatment that were proposed was you know radiation with ADT. So that was a standard care, and that with Daniel's but I mean I had the option just do the SBRT and avoid ADT. So I'm pretty pleased with, with the outcome and I don't have side effects related to ADT, I guess. So, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Howard, there's a gentleman named Brian who interjected about exercise when undergoing treatment. I'm wondering if any of our uh, uh, panelists have uh, are aware of exercise uh, and the effect on the body. Uh, I think Dr. Spratt mentioned there's a lot of things we don't know about our biology. Yeah. Well, yeah. Bruno, well, can you... AI tell us what to do? Or, or, or are we talking more generally here about 
exercise. Well, I guess to be brief, yes, I think I probably told Bruno, I, I prescribe exercise for every patient going through uh, radiation or hormone therapy. Uh, just for those men who do choose to have surgery, please note for six to eight weeks, please do not exercise because you need to let the healing occur or you could tear the stitches. So otherwise, though, every day of treatment, you can exercise if you want under radiation or on active surveillance, et cetera. Yeah, I was going to give a plug uh, for exercise reactive surveillance. Jeff uh, hosted uh, a webinar a few months back that's on uh, the ASPE website, uh, aspatients.org, with Dr. June, June Chan and other experts from University of California, San Francisco, uh, talking about the benefits of exercise. There, there was just a very large Swedish study that came out in the last couple of weeks which I wrote about in my newsletter, uh, uh, The Active Surveillor. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of research showing that exercise helps, and also there's growing information about diet helping. Now, I see Mike Wynn out in Denver. Mike, you, you got something? Yes, I'd like to go and make a quick comment about that. Uh, by the way, I'm a chief technology uh, officer for a technology com company in Denver. And we do quite a bit of machine learning using Bayesian you know, algorithm for our analysis of targeting. Uh, this is a defense uh, application. So Dr. Dan Spratt mentioned about, I'm glad that he mentioned about Thomas Fuchs you know, at the School of Medicine in Mount Sinai and Dr. Damara Lowton and John Hopkins regarding the PAGE system. The question I have is that essentially prostate cancer tend to very slow growing. So how do you plan on doing verification using either medical oncologist, urologist, or pathologist, looking at the slides, and it takes five years or 10 years before the predict value can be verified. That the first part of the question, the second part of the question is that, how is the AI system that you are working on compared to nomograms that are available online nowadays? Yeah, so, Regarding I mean, page AI, which is not something that we use at my center, I I make sure I understand the question. Um, that's really a binary readout, right? Is there cancer? Is there not cancer? And so their training doesn't need any follow up. It's not predicting uh, like the the recurrence rates. Regarding the work with our our Terra, right? It's taking well now. Tim can probably correct me. I think it's nine or maybe it's 10 large phase three completed randomized trials. So there's follow-up outcomes. And so they can, you know, it was trained and then multiply independently validated in various trials. As a radiation oncologist, um, I've never once looked at pathology slides, nor has my medical oncologist or urologist. So, I mean, yes, the pathologist will show them to us at tumor board, but I, I think us looking at the slides wouldn't, be very helpful. Um, so I, I'm not sh sure if I'm addressing the question you you have exactly. How does it compare to normal? Oh, yeah. So we've compared it to our the standard, you know, so most of the clinical tools actually, I, we're submitting something to a conference right now for this is a surgical cohort, a big randomized trial called the PUNCH trial, Dr. Easton from Memorial Sloan Kettering ran. And things like your the the pre -pro, the, all the men had prostatectomy, the Gleason score, the PSA, the T stage systems like Capra. Capra is a system that combines a bunch of these variables together. The surgical features, margin status, T stage, the AUCs for all of them in a randomized trial, right? So it's it's not retrospective. Um, it, it, none of them got above 0.65. The AUC. So they're all pretty poor. And even the Memorial Sloan Kettering Catan nomogram was fairly poorly calibrated, um, we showed. And so I think the available clinical tools are frankly just not very good. And it's we that's why I think we've over-treated men with prostate cancer for decades is because people hear, you know, people say, oh, I have a Gleason I think we'll find in a decade there's Gleason 7s, and I bet you there's Gleason 8s. We will do active surveillance on 
in time to come. Um, and I think we've put so much weight in Gleason inappropriately because Dr. Gleason never, ever said, I've trained this to tell you who to do surgery on and who to not treat. That's not what the system is. It's just how the cells look under a microscope and phenotypes and patterns. So, you know, I, I'd like to pick up on what Dan said. I was on a panel. I was the first patient uh, to be on a program uh, with uh, American Society for Clinical Oncology. Uh, and I have to tell you, they forgot me, which really pissed me off. And so I had to uh, grab the mic to get into the discussion. But uh, Dr. Uh, Freddie Hamdi, I, I think uh, Dr. Hamdi from uh, UK, who's headed a lot of these major trials, said to me, he after the program, he told me he saw the future of active surveillance is not with the low risk guys. He feels that eventually they're going to get better at diagnostics and guys like many of us will never even be diagnosed. We'll just go about our lives. He saw the future of active surveillance being in the Gleason sevens and now Dan's adding the eights. So if I'm hearing you right, Dan, am I hearing oh, yeah. you right? I mean, just to say there's an old trial uh, done 30 years ago. So this is like before the PSA screening era, it's called SPCG4. And they took low to high risk men and they did watchful waiting versus surgery. And if you look at the guys with high grade tumors, and this is again, way more aggressive than modern day high grade tumors that were on watchful waiting 20% of them never developed metastatic disease or died of prostate cancer, and they've been followed for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And they have Gleason 8 to 10 tumors. So clearly, there is biology that, you know, and if you were to tell anyone when I was in training, if you have Gleason 8 disease to watch it, you're insane. I'm not telling any of my patients with Gleason 8 to watch it, but I'm, what I'm saying is, is I know I am over-treating men, and we need these tools to figure out who doesn't need treatment? Yeah, I would just echo the, the pathologist that, that again, I've seen cases throughout my career, you know, the morphology is not the be all end all. Like you said, Gleason didn't calibrate or, or validate this to make those predictions. There are, you know, uh, you know, cancers that morphologically may look like a Gleason eight to me, but they behave very indolently. We, we just don't understand enough of the biology. Some of the molecular tools, you know, can start to help out. You see the discordance between a Gleason eight and a, and say a Prolaris or, or a decipher that's showing it's a very indolent tumor. We, we see these all the time. And so it, it's, it's, it's a work in progress. And the, the morphology is not the entire answer. Yeah, Bill, you were starting to talk. I know it's time yeah, there's, we we're going to quit. Yeah, there was a question in the chat that um, I don't know got addressed. I'd like to squeeze it in real quick from Kerr Mill. It says, if an individual has previously been diagnosed with prostate cancer, are there currently available AI tools for determining whether or not biopsy is indicated based on various clinical factors such as PSA, 4K, MRI, et cetera? And that's right, Kirk. I mean, that's some of what I think someone asked Kirk, how do they enroll in your trials or like when that's ready? But I think that's the test Kirk talked about once it's uh, you know ready to be deployed. Right, right. Yeah. And then they'll be able to do that. Like today, I'm not aware of any tools, AI tools available on the internet or elsewhere where you can just plug in all that information. And it, it again, it, it'll give you maybe a risk profile, but you, but nobody's going to tell you whether or not they have that biopsy or not. I mean, I think it, it's back down to that question of, of everybody, you know, somebody may only want a 5% risk of upgrading and somebody else may tolerate a 25% risk of upgrading before they decide to have that next biopsy. And so um, there's, you know, probabilistic calculators out there. And then we're hopeful that our, our blood test will add to the clinical information that's out there. Um, and somebody mentioned it earlier. I think it's very important as you're reading everything that that the baseline is the clinical uh, parameters and the models we can build. And I, I like when I'm reading the literature, people who, and we've done this in our studies, like with the PCPT risk calculator showing that our you know, test outperforms those calculators that are the standard, you know, uh, that's out there today from model. Okay. 
Okay, oh. and just to clarify on that, um, it was this is for someone who has not been diagnosed with prostate cancer. Oh, oh, this is like in the pre biopsy. Right. Again, I, I would refer somebody to like the like the calculators are out there, the PCPT, the PCBG. There, there, you can go onto these websites and plug in. And I think there's one in Memorial. There's there's several calculators that you can plug in. It's just not going to tell you have a biopsy, don't have a biopsy. It's going to tell right. you your risk of having aggressive cancer found on biopsy. And then you as a, you know, with shared decision-making have to decide what's your risk tolerance. Right. And and with, you know, and I know still there's some insurance barriers, you know, we now get MRIs before every biopsy. And we even have set up a system. If insurance denies it, we have a cash pay only MRI. That's only 250 bucks um, for a very short sequence for it. Um, but, you know, in the UK and various places, their goal is to not diagnose, you know, low risk prostate cancer. So they don't even they don't want to do active surveillance because they don't even want to diagnose the guy and all the and and so I think that using MRI is probably the best tool to because if it doesn't even show the pyrads four or five, you can probably watch it. Um, well, plus, Dan, you, let me ask you, you know, I, I noticed when you were talking about MRI uh, during during your talk and there there was a paper that just came out a few weeks ago at ASCO having to do with the Stockholm 3 uh, uh, PSA uh, reflex test um, and this was a study led by Dr. Egner here in Chicago and and they had a lot a lot of minority patients in there over 50 percent but I was kind of shocked at the percentage of patients in the study who had had MRIs. Uh, and it was only 16%. It was less than 20%. And so how commonly are MRIs used uh, around the country? I know it's going to vary from academic center to community, but realistically, I, I don't know where I got the idea that 50% was where it was at. I mean, is 16% where it's at? It might be a lower number. I mean, I would say the the range is zero to a hundred. <laughs> yeah, sure. But... That literally, unless you have a pacemaker or something like that, I mean, every patient I try to get an MRI for before a biopsy because, again, a biopsy. Although, I mean, you guys on the call all know, but you know, it has a one percent plus or minus risk of infection. You know, if it's transperineal, maybe you know lower, but it's not benign when you're talking about millions are done. And so if it, a non-invasive test like an MRI can help screen out if you need a biopsy, plus you need a fusion biopsy. You got to biopsy the dominant tumor you see on MRI. So you, when you don't do that, when you go straight to ultrasound, you then you get an MRI. Well, then you need another biopsy to do the fusion biopsy. So it, it's... I think it's going to be all based upon the local um, insurance as well as the type of center you go to. Oh, and then um, several people have asked about studies, either Dan studies or Kirk studies or maybe Tim studies. So if there's some contact information that you can put into the uh, chat, if people can get in touch I, I noticed Dan put something, but I'm not sure if yeah. Kirk or Tim did. I'll put my personal email, guys, uh, just as you can imagine, I, I'm averaging 650 emails a day, and my patients come first. So if you want to be seen as a patient, I put Nicole Gebhardt, who can get you in, and in that sense, patients to me come first. This email is a hodgepodge. If I don't respond, I promise it's because I missed it. Uh, it's not because I didn't want to respond. And I, I don't, I'm sure Kirk and Tim can relate to the abuse of email. So, yeah. So, you know, if Kirk and Tim, if there's some resource that you want to share. And, you know, I know we called to for an end at one uh, thirty. I don't know if there's some final questions or, you know, I, you know, I'll turn it over to our executive director, Bill. Well, it looks looks like we've covered most all of the ones in the chat box. So if there's any final words, 
um, we'll call it a day. This has been a fabulous meeting. And um, again, as a reminder, it's being recorded and will be up on our website, uh, hopefully in about a week. Well, is there anything we can say about upcoming meeting? You know, is uh, is oh, those are a well kept secret. Are they? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, how about this? Will there be an upcoming meeting? Oh, of course. Okay. Because I I know, and for the right price, I'll tell. But <laughs> um, so it's yeah. Mark, is there anything you can say about March? March well, if you want, I can. I, I, I think uh, we, all of us seem to have uh, urination BPH issues, and uh, that seems to be plaguing even the men that uh, are, have gotten some peace with the, their prostate cancer. So I think we're going to be talking about that subject, and we welcome all of you and bring your stories. I, we'll have a panel of uh, a number of us. Uh, we also have had a webinar with, I think his name was, uh, um, back in July. Uh, if you go, go look at the webinars, there's a Dean, whole Dean Alterman from University uh, Alterman, of Toronto. Dean, yes. Uh, yeah, check that out uh, as background. But uh, it's come, and there's some, some other things we'll deal with. And then we also had another one with Dr. Kaplan from, right. uh, from New York. I, th I think mm -hmm. he's at NYU, I think. So... What can I say? But thanks to everybody. Special thanks to our speakers. Dan's mm -hmm. going to be coming back for another dose. Uh, come maybe in June, talking about focal therapy. And, uh, you know, everybody have a great weekend. Don't worry about your prostate, okay? <laughs> <laughs>